Okay, cool. Thank you for bearing with us with all of these kind of technical issues that we've had the past couple of weeks. Um, since spring break is coming up, we're going to try to get them resolved. But for today, we're going to move forward um, with what we've got. So today, we're going to be talking about auto layout and plugins. I think this is one of like one of the most interesting lectures. Auto layout is a pretty unique trait to Figma. And it's pretty um, relevant, especially if you want to go into UI UX um, or any kind of product design work. It is particularly important in those fields. So we're going to be diving into what this concept of auto layout is. Plus, we'll be talking a bit more about plugins and some other kind of design principles that we find really important um, as we move forward with kind of more complex projects in this class. So um, this is the kind of wrap up for today or what we're going to be talking about um, and this is the attendance form as per usual so if you want to go ahead to bit.ly slash fdsp22 like seven that's the attendance form if you could send that in the chat also that would be great um, and then the file as per usual is at bit.ly slash figma decal dash like seven so you can reference um, both the file of the slides that we're going to be talking about today but also the demo I would actually really encourage you to open up the demo for this particular lecture because the auto layout stuff is not necessarily super intuitive on its own. It's something that you have to try a couple of times. It's really one of those um, kind of skills that you have to really get into your fingers to start to really understand. Um, so yeah, I really encourage you to open these up if you can. All right, with that, um, I also wanted to ask if anybody had any questions regarding the midterm. Um, so as you know, it was due yesterday. I'm very, very excited to take a look at all of the midterms. Um, if you have an extension on it as well, feel free to um, spend some more time working on it. Um, make sure to communicate with your TA. Um, if you haven't completed the midterm and you didn't receive or request an extension, still reach out to your TA and or me. I'll try to work something out. There is a slip day until the end of the night tonight um, that you can get for free. Um, you get one slip day across the midterm and the final. Um, I know the kind of deadline stuff can be a little bit confusing, so let us know if you have any questions. Um, but yeah, does anybody have any questions or comments about the midterm overall that we can kind of address now? Um, if not, we can go ahead and move on. If you have any questions, feel free to message in Slack or to message, uh, reach out to me specifically if you want to chat about anything. Cool. Um, one bigger announcement that we also didn't get to like incorporate into any of our content is that today, like literally this morning, uh, Figma actually announced Fig Jam for iPad. So if you have an iPad or just if you generally are an iPad user, um, I would highly encourage like downloading it, taking a look around with it. I think a lot of the functionality on iPad, like the pencil tool, works a lot better on iPad um, for Fig Jam. Um, I think it's gonna be a really interesting thing to play around with. I think it might be a fun thing to just use as like a note-taking tool um, to doodle around with in class or anything that you need. Um, so I would recommend taking a look if you're interested in that. This came out literally this morning at 7 a.m. So we don't have slides on it, but hopefully it is pretty intuitive. Cool. So with that, we're going to go ahead and get into the actual content for today about auto layout. Um, cool. So auto layout is all about designing kind of dynamicism and modularity in your work. It's about making something that can kind of interact or um, change as you um, basically resize the kind of container that is contained within. Um, so going into that, um, what can you actually do with, oh, shoot, sorry. Um, yeah, sorry, that's what I was just saying, but it's a property that basically lets you add um, of the ability to grow or fill or shrink or kind of make it fit within the contents of whatever you're designing within. So if you have, say, like a piece of text that you um, normally see in a text box, the way that it's kind of resizing as you add more text to it is like one example of conceptualizing auto layout. And it's great when you need to kind of make modular pieces of UI. So when you think about um, components that we've been talking about, you know, sometimes you have a button that has like a default size to it, but you don't necessarily want it to always be that size. If you have maybe more text or less text within it, auto layout is an example of how you can make something be more reactive and responsive and dynamic, um, while still kind of maintaining the same structure and systems that you've been using. Um, if you're familiar with any kind of uh, like development stuff with CSS or HTML. Um, it's pretty similar to the concept of Flexbox in CSS, um, and it's like very closely tied um, in concept. So if you're familiar with that, we can talk more about that later on as well. So what can you actually do with auto layout? We understand it's this, it's this idea of dynamicism. Um, one example here with buttons, you can see that without auto layout, having additional text in a button is going to kind of flow or overflow out of it. Um, it's going to kind of just be a little bit ugly, maybe. Um, but if you have auto layout applied, it's going to be able to make the button 
even wider. It's going to resize to fit whatever text that you have. It's going to accommodate whatever your needs are. Um, in the second example, we have these kind of menus and lists. Um, this ability to really quickly reorder things is another really great tool in auto layout. So if you've currently used any kind of smart selection, you might have seen before um, that you can select multiple objects and essentially drag them and have them maintain their spacing, maintain their relative order to each other, um, but redrag them or reorder them in a way that um, keeps most of like the settings that you've applied to them. Auto layout does this automatically as well without you having to do the whole selection process. So if you have say this list of items here, you can go ahead and click and drag any of them if they're in an auto layout and reorder them really easily. Um, the third is creating responsiveness, like we talked about. Um, this is really helpful for, say, like you're on a website um, and you need to resize whatever you're working in. Or even, for example, if I'm in Zoom and I need to resize the screen that I'm looking at, you know, how is the um, screen that I'm sharing going to react when I make the screen a lot thinner, when I make the screen a lot wider? Um, I need all of the content to still be readable and usable, no matter what size phone I'm using, no matter what size desktop I'm on. It needs to make sense across everything. And as a designer, you really can't design for like assuming everybody has like a, I don't know, like 800 pixel wide phone. Everyone has a different pixel wide phone. And so it's important to make sure that everything um, stays readable and stays usable, no matter what size you have. So you can add auto layout basically to any frame or selection of objects. So that can be components, groups, um, different layers, for example. Um, in order to add auto layout to a component, um, the kind of shortcut that you want to remember is Shift A, or you can just click the plus button in the right sidebar next to the words auto layout. Um, you can also right click it. So if I were to say, look at pieces of text here or look at any kind of objects here, um, what I can do is select these two um, different slides. They're basically frames. And then under auto layout here, I see that there's a plus button. So I can go ahead and click that and it's going to apply auto layout. Um, I can also do shift A. So if I press shift A, it's going to do the same thing that just happened. Um, so getting into actually like the whole functionality of auto layout, you know, what can you actually do with it? What are all the words that are going to be associated with auto layout? Um, the first is this very basic idea of direction. So direction, there are two of them, horizontal or vertical. It describes the direction in which the auto layout frame will flow. Um, in order to have things go along the y-axis, so from top down, from top to bottom, um, you want to use vertical, which means that every object is going to be put one on top of the other like this. Horizontal is the same idea, but going from left to right. Um, so any object that you add is going to be moving towards the right. Everything by default, I think, is um, left to right, because that's the English reading order. Um, it's going to basically go along the x-axis. So in this example, we see that these buttons here are organized horizontally. Um, so you can add an additional button to the right of it. But if you look more closely, when we directly add these, this whole card is organized vertically. So there is the brutalism tour that is one piece of information. The second is this kind of explore description. And underneath it is this entire row of buttons. And though those are stacked one on top of the other vertically. Um, so to build anything that is like this, that has multiple directions going on, where part of it is oriented vertically and part of it is oriented horizontally, you'll have to nest these auto layout frames. And as you see here, all that means is just dragging them inside of each other. And they're going to operate kind of as independent little like containers for the items that they're holding. Now the second property um, besides direction is spacing. Spacing you might already be familiar with in smart selection, for example, is the same general idea. You can talk about the horizontal space between them represented by this icon of just like two cards with a space in between them highlighted or a vertical space between as well. This is just how many pixels apart things are. And remember calling back to the lecture that talks more about spacing. Sorry, the lights went off again. You just wave your arms around. Um, Hopefully it turns back on. Um, but if we talk about spacing before, um, a major part of that is like this eight point or four point or 12 point spacing system. A lot of the time you're gonna want to adhere to those spacing systems as well. So this kind of in between spacing. Thank you. Padding, um, if you're familiar with CSS or HTML, padding is another phrase that comes up a lot in kind of doing front end work or visual work. Um, padding controls the empty space between the objects inside and the actual boundary of the auto layout frame. So in this example, the child object or whatever is inside of it is the word button, while the padding is the white space that's between the word button and the actual um, 
black border of the button itself. Um, so entering a value in one of these fields is going to set it to be the same amount of padding on all four sides, which is what you might logically think, you know, if you want something exactly centered, it's logical to have the padding the same on all four sides. But there are also cases where you want additional padding on maybe the top or additional padding on both the left and the right side, or maybe you just want additional padding on one side. So if you click into um, an icon right here, it's going to open up more detailed um, examples so you can make the padding actually what you exactly need it to be. So you're going to see a lot that auto layout has a lot of very basic functionality where you can just put in numbers really quickly, but it also lets you really hyper customize to be as specific as you need to be to be really, really pixel perfect. Um, if you just go like one step deeper into the settings. So again, to, to cover this again, um, direction is like the direction things flow in and padding is kind of the outside space around the objects in between the frame. Alignment is how you want to align child objects within an auto layout frame. So in this case, um, I have basically a nested item called these like item boxes, and then I have them within a larger auto layout frame, and I want to space them in particular ways. Um, Figma implements this through this kind of interactive grid system that you can click around in that kind of visually explains where it'll be. So you see here, this puts them in the middle. It went to the left, the bottom, the top right. Um, there's two functionalities here. There's packed and there's space between. They try to make these like pieces of copy in these words as clear as possible. Um, but clicking around them will kind of give you an idea. Packed here means that the items are close together with the spacing that you've set between them. Whereas space between, if you see here, it actually overrides whatever we had set the spacing to be and replaces it um, with auto because what it is doing is having them be as far apart as possible, evenly split to fill the container. So if you see here, when we switch to space between, it's going to fill up the entire container uh, horizontally because that's the direction they go in. Um, and then we can align them at the top, middle, or bottom here as well. Distribution is what we just talked about with packed and space between. Um, so there are different cases where you might want to use different versions of this. Sometimes if you want things to be uh, packed, you want them to be quite close together. So for example, in this um, kind of menu or nav bar that we have here, um, the example for space between um, has the, has, this is basically two distinct objects, not six or seven of them, where the logo of the word Filma is one object and the entire nav bar with like home shop, blog about, contact button, that is a second object that is in another entire auto layout frame. So treat these mentally right now as two objects. If you have them packed, it'll be one on the far right and one on the far left, or sorry, if you have them spaced between, it'll be one on the far right and one on the far left. If you have them packed, it's gonna be one next to the other with however much spacing that you have determined. So packed is close, space between is far. Resizing. So when we talked before about this idea of constraints, resizing is pretty similar to that. It determines what's going to happen if you change the size of the container that whatever your auto layout frame is in. So in the case of having a fixed width or height, you would basically, it would not resize at all. It would stay whatever width it is, whatever height it is, um, no matter what you make the outside um, container that it is um, the size. Um, however, if you're doing auto layout, chances are you're probably not going to want to do this and you'll want to go between hug content and or fill container. Hug content means that the frame resizes itself according to the child objects while keeping the tightest possible dimensions and it surrounds the objects within it. Um, so basically, if I have set the contents to be a certain width, it'll keep as close as possible um, and kind of extend it out as the frame goes out, whereas fill container has a child object stretch to fit the width or the height of their parent frame. This is a little bit hard to conceptualize, so we'll kind of go through this in the demo and visualize the differences a little bit better. Now, nesting is something that I mentioned earlier as well. Um, anytime you've applied an auto layout frame to a set of components or to a single component, um, think about that whole auto layout as like one object that you can then manipulate in other ways. So in this example, you wanna think of this um, set of times all four of them, you can think of them as a single object that I can then grab and put this like large container into another larger container um, that is organized vertically in this case. So when you nest an auto layout frame, keep in mind the nested frame will have both the parent and the child properties. This can be a little bit confusing and it's a good thing in auto layout to try to continue best practice as much as you can and to be careful of what you're setting. Um, a lot of the times it's tempting to do like band-aid fixes or to like really quickly apply things that we think are right um, or just kind of our, our, our best guess at things. 
which can cause problems a little bit later down the line. So it is important to be intentional um, and to make sure that all of these kind of child and parent um, properties are inherited as you go up. So if you want to nest our layout frames, the two main ways that you're probably going to end up going about this are either to one, drag an auto layout frame into an existing one, or two, to create a new frame around the selection of objects. This is an example of like a kind of more aggressive way that you would actually end up um, nesting it in practice. So we can go um, basically from the bottom most layer up to the top most layer. Um, so the bottom most layer, um, the most simple concept of auto layout here is a button. So a button that resizes anything that is like dynamic in that way is the simplest kind of auto layout. It is a horizontal auto layout that expands if the text is longer. So this allows the singular button to grow and shrink as we change the label inside of it. The next layer we want to go into is the button row. So this is a case where you have two, three, four, five buttons. Uh, we want them to be equally spaced apart no matter how much we modify the size of them. So we'll add a horizontal auto layout object um, that encapsulates those two buttons together. And now we've had this one button row that we can treat as a singular object um, that can then go into the next level, which is this whole post, this singular post. Um, we add our buttons into a vertical auto layout with other objects that are inside of the post. So the example here would be the description, which is in itself a profile picture and a name. That can also be another auto layout object that is horizontal. We can treat each row as one object. So this is one object. This image itself is a second object. This description is a third object. And then the button row that we made is a fourth object. Those four objects are now vertically stacked on top of each other. If you think of like a Twitter, uh, a Twitter post or an Instagram post, you have this general format down. Um, and then each of those posts is now it's in its own box, its own container that is a vertical auto layout. And then finally, if we want to have a lot of posts that show up in some kind of feed, we can have two posts and then put them um, into another larger container that is another vertical auto layout to create our feed. And the idea here is that all of these properties are gonna make these really dynamic and really easy to change because you know, all of these posts are not necessarily going to have say the same image height or the same description length of text or the same like amount of letters in the usernames. Um, and then all of these posts that are in the feed are gonna be different lengths and we want them to be distributed in a way that is dynamic and easily makes sense. Any questions about this idea of nesting around auto layout? Cool. We'll go ahead and move on um, to the actual demo where we're actually going to basically build what we just talked about. Um, so if you want to go then to the um, link that we have in, just in the chat, which is um, bit.ly slash figma decal um, lex7, you can go ahead and find this demo on the second page. So if you have this open, I would recommend you open up the demo page. Um, this is currently locked. This kind of demo frame is locked. It's going to give you all of like the information if you want to click on it. So later after we try this, you can unlock it to see how it works. Um, but our goal right now is to basically build out this news feed that has two posts basically in the way that we just described. So looking into what this does, we have this button, this button that is a basic square and has the word like inside of it. We have a button row um, that contains three buttons inside of it. And these appear to be spaced between because they go from the fully left side to the fully right side instead of being packed closely together. Above that, we have um, something in this vertical auto layout box. It's the image. Above that, we have a description or kind of the text part. And then above that, we have the image and the username. That could also be an auto layout. Um, but again, we have these four rows that we can build into one post, which you can then build into one news feed. Cool, we'll go ahead and get started here. Let's start with this button. So let's grab this piece of text that's just like, um, I'll drag it out and copy it here. And then, sorry, I'm gonna put this here. Cool. Um, so if you have the piece of text that says like, are you okay with the lights off? Yeah. Okay, we're just gonna go ahead and leave it. I'm glad the sun is setting later now. So we have like, and I want to apply auto layout to it so it can be a dynamic box. So I'm gonna go ahead and um, just press shift A in this case, so shift A. It's going to change to have auto layout here, and I want to have um, a stroke. So adding a stroke to it is going to give me a black line. And then let's make this, you know, let's just give it 12 point padding. I think we'll start at spacing 12 point padding. That sounds good to me. Um, and just to kind of talk about what we mentioned earlier, I can modify these so we could have it actually be like 24 on the sides. 
And that way it's gonna be a little bit wider than it is tall. If we look in the example, it looks like that's kind of what it is here. Maybe it's a little bit bigger, but we'll go ahead and make this our button. Then I'm gonna rename this to button. I just did um, command R to rename it to button. So now that we have a single button, I'm gonna make some copies of it. Um, I've got three likes now, but I want this one to say comment. Um, and as you see here, when I just did that, um, the size of this did re um, change and it now is a little bit thinner. So as I add more text, you're gonna see that the whole box outside of it um, resizes appropriately. So for this, I want it to just say comment. And then for this, I want it to just say share. And now we've got these three buttons that are all different widths, but they are kind of the same component, you could say. So now I want to put all three of these into one auto layout. And if you see here, I'm just gonna like, for the purpose of demonstration, put them like not really aligned and then we'll see what happens here. So I'm gonna select them all, even though they're not aligned very nicely and then add auto layout with um, this plus button. It's gonna pop them all into place. So you saw that they actually vertically aligned them for me. And then they um, kind of evened out the spacing to be 114. So again, as we mentioned in this case, we do want it to be spaced between instead of packed, but I'll go ahead and visualize that. Um, so if we have this be space between, I have to click here and go to space between. At the moment, it's not gonna make a lot of sense because this isn't inside of another larger frame. Um, but once we kind of modify this to go inside of the post, it'll make more sense. So for now, I will leave it as packed and I will put the um, spacing at just like 120 or something. But we will go back and change this in a little bit. Is strange. It, but the frame itself is actually not the, the same width. So maybe this is a case where we do actually want to make it space between. Cool. All right, so I'll leave it at that for now. Oh yeah, this is how I can show the example, I suppose. When it's space between, when I change the frame that it's in, like this whole thing that's called frame one, I guess I can call it a button row. Um, the space between means that it's going to resize dynamically. But if I actually have this set to be Packed, and then I have it be about like, let's say 60 pixels apart. When I resize this frame, it's actually not gonna listen to me. It's just gonna be um, in the places that I had it, but this frame um, can still resize on its own. Um, and so the whole object will be the way that it is. So I'm gonna go ahead and change it back to being space between. I'm um, gonna leave it at that. So this is the button row. We've made our basically second of our auto layout components. So we'll go ahead and try to do um, this top part here. So I'm gonna grab an avatar and I'm gonna grab the name. And so for these two, I also want them to basically be um, horizontal auto laid out. So I'm gonna grab these two, click the plus button and add auto layout to them. And you see here that they're not quite um, aligned horizontally or aligned vertically. So oh. what the heck? Okay. I think that might actually just be an auto layout constraint. So in this case, if I wanted to make sure that they stayed the same um, height, one thing I could do is actually make this text box a little bit taller. Um, so I see that here, this is 64 pixels. So I'm going to go ahead and see if I can make this a little bit taller and make the text itself here. So making the text box be the same height as the photo itself, we're going to make sure that they stay centered um, as long as I click on this um, for the alignment, the align middle. So this is now our second item. This is the avatar. Um, and I can have the spacing here be, let's say, 48 or maybe 36. Uh, and now I have this um, second object that was gonna be above the button row. So now all I'm gonna add is the piece of text um, and the image that we can grab right here. Um, these two pieces of information, can go ahead and drag these out. So these um, kind of individual objects of the text and the image, I don't necessarily need to make their own auto layout frame because they're individual images or individual um, layers that don't have an additional set of like nesting within them. We can go ahead and take a quick look at what the demo does as well to make sure that it matches with the thoughts. Um, but yeah, in this case, I wouldn't necessarily need to make them more complex. So you see here in the example, um, they have the buttons, the image, um, the piece of text and the author. Um, without any additional auto layout in here. So I'm gonna grab these four and I want to combine these into one post. So I'm gonna go ahead and say um, auto layout again. So shift A and it's gonna even out all of the spacing vertically. I can change this to be maybe 24. Now I see that these four items are nicely aligned. And so talking about that re, um, 
that reordering principle we had earlier. If I click on this image now, I can see if it selected the image right now and drag it up and down. Um, it's actually just going to really nicely like leave things in the um, kind of spacing that it is right now. Um, so I can easily reorder stuff. This particular case, it's maybe not that helpful, um, but in a lot of cases it would be. And so if I was maybe designing like a new social media feed for something, um, I can reorder if I want the image above it or not. Um, so that's one example that I could do here. You see here that also the button row is not at the width that I want it to be. So I can go into this and instead of saying fixed width, I can say fill container. And filling the container means that if I um, make this wider, the buttons are gonna move with it. Um, whereas if I did something different, it would not. So if I select the button row again, and I say, instead of fill a container, I wanted to hug the contents, then this is gonna stay the width of the button row itself, which we have set to be um, 497 pixels. And this can be changed here. I can drag it out here and it's gonna stay that width. Um, but no matter what, if I resize this whole thing, it's not gonna modify um, the button row. So again, going back to our button row, we want it to not, Hug contents, we want it to fill container. Um, go ahead and do that. Then we want each of the buttons within it um, to not be uh, packed. We want these to be actually spaced between. Cool. All right, so now we have the general post content. So we're going to go ahead and re rename this to be content. Uh, renaming is a good habit to always keep um, as you kind of go through your design work. Um, and so now we want to actually just have two posts. So I will go ahead and make a second one uh, with option. And I will select these two and add auto layout to them um, and set it to be maybe like 48 pixels apart and then add a stroke to it that's a little bit wider. Um, I'm making the example here. Let's have it be outside and then let's add some padding um, as I did in the example as well. Um, so here, you know, for this padding, we have um, a little bit of space on the left and the right side of the text, whereas here we do not. So I'll go ahead and add maybe 12 pixels of padding, maybe a little bit more. And now we've got more or less what the example is. Um, we can fill the frame to be white um, and we can compare now, you know, what might be different um, between these two. But if you followed along, that is a pretty complex set of auto layout functions that we've done relatively quickly. Um, if you have any questions, please do message in the chat. I'll be happy to answer them. I know I went to the demo kind of fast, um, but that's basically the gist of auto layout. Um, for the most part, I would say auto layout really is a skill that you need to just practice and actually incorporate into your work. So if you catch yourself making any buttons in the future, for example, um, try to just make the buttons auto layout. If you catch yourself making a menu of some kind um, in some kind of like settings page, go ahead and just add some auto layout vertically. It won't make that much of a cosmetic difference, but it is going to be helpful in just good design practice in the future. If you say have to resize anything, it's going to make your life a lot easier. And also, if you're going to be building anything that's going to be shipped or it's basically going to be developed, I would highly encourage you to always be cognizant of how to use auto layout in a um, logical manner. Cool. Any questions about the demo? All right, um, if that's all for now, we're going to take a couple of minutes break, probably three or four minutes. Um, we'll come back at around 6.49 to talk about content-driven design, plain language, and plugins. Cool. All right, hello, um, we are back now. We're gonna go ahead and talk about kind of the rest of our topics for today. They're not quite as technical as auto layout, um, but I do think there are some of the most important um, like conceptual topics that we cover that I think you might not necessarily find in a lot of other classes. Um, so I hope this is helpful to y'all. Um, so first we're gonna be discussing content-driven design and why I freaking hate lorem ipsum. So content-driven design focuses on using actual content the entire way through your design process in order to help you actually make decisions better. Um, so content, when we say that, can include anything from like text, photos, videos, charts, tables, lists, anything. Um, that you maybe don't necessarily have when you're designing things. Like say you're working with a client, you might not actually know what all of the pieces of text are going to say, just know there's going to be pieces of text. That's an example where you might be tempted to use filler text or lorem ipsum, um, but 
having actual content that's representative of what the user is going to actually see is going to help you make smarter decisions as you go through this process and also expose things that you might not notice before. So the whole point of this is knowing what your design's purpose is and how your designs are going to work towards achieving that purpose even before you get to the point of like shipping it or like finally handing it off. So imagine you're building a house. We're going to use a little bit of an analogy here. So using placeholder content is like telling the architect, just build the framework and we'll decide what we're going to use the building for later on. But if the architect doesn't know what kind of building they're creating, how are you going to have a good house? How are you going to know, you know, if you tell the architect, just make a house for me and then not say how many people are going to live there, how many bathrooms you need, how many bedrooms you need, what kind of color the walls are supposed to be, any of that information, then they're going to have to give you a pretty bare bones thing that can work for maybe a kind of work for a lot of people as opposed to really working for the specific people that they're designing with. Um, so when we worry about what a website, for example, needs to look like first and foremost, if we only care about the visual layer of it, it's not going to be usable. We're going to have a lot of placeholders. It's going to look really good for dribble. Um, and then we don't know how the flow is going to work or how a user is actually going to be reacting when they see um, not lorem ipsum, but instead actual pieces of text that interact with like important information that they need to learn or how they're going to find pieces of data that they're looking for. So design should essentially mold to the content that they are delivering rather than it being the other way around. So a lot of the times, like in this particular example, designers will take, you know, a lorem ipsum generator. Also, just to be clear, if you haven't been familiar with lorem ipsum, it's fake text um, that's just generated in some way. I think it's supposed to like look like Latin, but none of it actually means anything. Um, and so people will use it as a way to like get quick, like placeholder text that looks like it's real instead of just saying like blah, 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 something, something, something. Um, so basically designers will take lorem ipsum and just grab three lines of it exactly, or like six words of it exactly, um, because it looks like it'll fit the content that you've created or fit the design that you've had. However, when you pick that kind of spacing or you pick that length of text, it's not necessarily going to be reflective of how long that text information might be here. So in this example, we've got this kind of gardening coach website um, description set up, and all of these cards have like three really nice lines of text. However, if you had to talk to Jackie to write a description in a bio and then talk to Georgia to make a description in bio and talk to Karen and make a description in bio, one person might write six words, one person might write two pages, and one person might write like a nice paragraph like you're expecting them to. However, your designs need to be able to handle all of those different cases. So basing your designs around the actual content, maybe by going and talking to the three of them and saying, hey, what would you submit if I wrote write a bio here? Um, it's actually going to let you handle those quote unquote edge cases after or, or before you actually get to that point. So when you think about different sizes, restrictions, and use cases, so like we talked about with Flexbox, for example, or with Auto Layout, for example, um, you're able to preemptively solve those problems before you even necessarily get there. So this term of edge cases is something that we kind of use often. It's essentially referring to any state or kind of circumstance that you might not necessarily see all the time, but it could come up. So one common edge case is say like somebody with a really, really long name. A lot of the time names are going to be assumed to be relatively short, but if somebody has a longer name, then it might overflow. It might have to end in an ellipsis. It might have to go into a second line. Um, that's a case where um, there are these edge cases of people who have particularly long names or particularly short names that it is really important to those users that their name is displayed correctly. But if you as the designer don't account for it or don't address it, it becomes an issue when they're actually using the um, product that you've made them. So here's another example. Uh, it might be kind of small right now, but there are a lot of problems with the screenshot. It uses a ton of different like placeholder things, not even just text, but other objects as well. This is kind of emblematic of the kind of work that you often see on Dribble. And I always spend a lot of this class basically bashing on Dribble, which is maybe my bad, um, but I really don't think that a lot of the design work that is there is necessarily useful to anybody um, because it's made to be like flashier to look good. And like at a glance, this looks great. They've had a great palette. There's great color distribution. It looks very, very clean. However, I have no idea at all what it's actually supposed to do, which seems like an issue if I'm looking at this design and I don't know what it's actually designed for. So a couple of examples that are not good about this. Um, the names here, um, because these are kind of stories or kind of displayed at the top, 
it's really difficult to fit any kind of longer name like we mentioned earlier. A really direct parallel to this is maybe Instagram stories where it shows a part of the username and then has like clipped afterwards. That might necessarily actually be the best way to go around doing that, but they would at least have an example of what a longer name would look like or what happens maybe if somebody hasn't put in a name yet. In this example, everyone has nice names that fit very nicely. And so the designer might not actually be thinking about, hey, what do I do if somebody has a very long first name? Um, these graphs and charts are also quite ambiguous. Um, all it says here is analytics and it has different days of the week, but it doesn't actually share any information about what the blue means, what the green means and what the pink means. If for example, these are actually like costs and maybe um, revenue that this company has, it's unlikely that the distribution would look this way. It's unlikely they had one day that was all costs and one day that was all revenue. And so these graphs do not necessarily a great job explaining kind of information that they need to explain at a glance. Um, this one as well, um, it's, you know, these are all associated with different kinds of things. One says UK, one says US, one says Spain, and one says Italy. But in this example, why is there a piece of the graph missing? You know, what is this actually telling me it's not really clear. And if it's not clear to me um, upon first glance, it's likely not gonna be clear to whatever users will finally go towards. So if you have say an app that has actual data visualizations in it, take actual data and then think about, you know, how would I actually represent this? Maybe this type of graph is not the best way to do it. Maybe a pie chart is not the best way to do it. Um, once you actually look at the data and come up with a way to visualize it in a way that makes sense, rather than making it just look good, um, you'll be able to have a better kind of piece of design there. Now, lastly, these placeholder gradient images, um, they look real nice. And I have no idea what they're supposed to be. They don't give any actual indication of how the app would function. Um, and on top of that, I think they use color in a way that wouldn't necessarily be represented in the actual function of the app. So if these are say like photos of, I don't know, stocks um, that somebody would upload, you wouldn't have this nice balance of like blue and green and purple that you see on here. Um, this, these, Gradient images add a lot of like the color balance to the entire screen. But if you're in a case where these are like largely black, you know, the whole vibe of the screen, for lack of a better word, is going to be off or it's going to be not what the designer is going for. So if they actually want to incorporate these colors, they will need to include it in the UI somewhere, or they need to incorporate it in a different way that is more reliable. Oh. So now that we know kind of what not to do, these examples of like text that isn't necessarily emblematic of what you'd normally be doing, and then visuals or graphics that are not emblematic of what you'd actually be seeing, um, how do we actually approach making content-driven design? So good content here is based on your users and their motivations. So as we kind of have talked about throughout this course, you're almost never really designing just for yourself. You're designing for a user, you're designing for a set of people who have problems that you can identify um, and needs that you can identify. So understanding all of those is really critical to make sure that you are designing something that is at the end of the day, useful to them and not just good for you. So there's a lot of different research tools that you can use to inform content-driven design. And you can start here with just thinking about a couple of just basic questions. So first, what are you actually trying to communicate to your audience? You know, when they see the app, they're not gonna have worked on it for several weeks. They're not gonna have had all of the basic research or all the really in-depth understanding of the problems that you might have. Um, and they are gonna be left with whatever visuals they see on their phone, on their screen, whatever it is that you're creating for them. So what do you want to communicate really quickly and really intuitively? Second, what has the user seen before they get to your content? So this is a case where maybe designing for, um, oh, man. Um, like designing maybe for children is gonna be very different from designing for maybe a college student. A child maybe isn't familiar with social media platforms or maybe they are now, um, but they might not necessarily be comfortable with the existing kind of UI patterns that maybe a college student at like UC Berkeley would be. Um, but on a more granular level as well, maybe you're working with a nonprofit and you're working to create a, an application for a program that they run. If the app is for people who are already in the program, then they would have that kind of background knowledge. Let's say you're making an app for marine biologists. You would assume that they already know something about marine biology. And you don't have to give as much context into those pieces. However, if you're making an app about marine biology for five-year-olds, you can't assume that they know what like, I can't even think of a marine biology term. If you're making an app for me, you can't assume that I know anything about marine biology. So what has the user actually um, had context about before they get to whatever you're showing them? And finally, 
what is the user actually looking for? Most of the time when you're on an app, you are looking to find something, do something, get something. Um, how many steps does it take to get there? And how are they efficiently going to find what they need? Um, depending on what you're talking about, for the most part, a lot of technology is about getting to something as quickly as possible or as efficiently as possible. The whole flip side of that is maybe social media, where you want people to use something as long as possible or as much as possible. Um, so that's kind of the two main cases you might want to think about is how do I get them to be efficient and quick or how do I get them to stay engrossed? So a couple of different methods in terms of UX research, if you are interested in research in any way, these are really good um, kind of practices that you might come across and that you can implement in your own work as well. Um, the first is card sorting. So you can give participants or potential users a deck of cards with words or images that are related to the problem that you've created. And you can ask them to sort them and basically create categories in a way that makes sense to them. So if you were to do this on your own, you might understand or conceptualize these ideas in a little bit of a different way. But having your users actually go ahead and do this means that you can see how your users think. This helps you develop basically an information architecture that aligns with your users' expectations and values. When we say information architecture, we basically mean the way that we've constructed um, the flow of whatever product you were creating. So let's say that we have this example that has a lot of words about like how to apply, tuition, is this something related to college or something related to schools? Um, if they sort it into this way, where they have two things under academics, under tuition and under admissions, let's say that we're building a website. These might be the main pages where these are sub pages that they would then find. But these are kind of the words that they associate at a higher level as the categories that they fall under. You could also argue, you know, in this particular example, one person might actually associate, associate like majors and minors closer to admissions if say your college um, admits students based on how many people apply to a particular major. Um, somebody might actually consider how to apply falling under tuition if there's an application fee. Um, so asking a lot of people to do this and asking actual users to do it is going to help you reveal what do most users feel um, when confronted with these ideas. The second method is journey mapping. This is something that I think we've touched on before and is a very, very common thing you're gonna see in a lot of UI UX fields. Um, the idea here is to visualize major interactions, high points, low points, midpoints um, that shape a user's experience to accomplish a particular goal. So, you know, what is the actual journey they go on? What are the steps they go through? And then how do they feel at each of those steps? At the end of the day, a lot of the things that we do are driven by the way that we feel. Um, a lot of times, if you have an app that you really dislike, you're gonna stop using it because you feel bored with it or you feel frustrated with it. If there's an app that makes you feel really excited or makes you feel really happy, um, you're gonna wanna use it more often. And so a lot of the time, the goal of these journey maps is to identify the low points and then address those low points and bring them up. So in this particular case, we have um, this user that we've probably um, conglomerated from a list of like many, many users that we've talked to um, named Jumping Jamie, who wants to switch her mobile plan. So in this case, we want to define the problem um, where her issue is that she wants to pay less for her phone plan. Um, you get to a step of comparison, negotiation, and then selection. So if she is a customer who wants to change her phone plan, those are the basic steps she's going to go through. She's going to compare with other um, programs, discuss with all of them to see where she can get the best deal and the best benefits, and then pick one of them. So in this um, journey map, you can see um, it goes up when they wonder, they have this kind of hopefulness here, um, when they wonder if they can save some money. It goes down when they feel like they're finding places that are a better deal. It goes to like a lower point when they find that it's just really difficult to do so and they want to switch providers. They get to the most frustrated point, which causes them to leave the product that they're currently using and go to a better one. Um, and at the end of the day, hopefully this graph kind of goes up in order to indicate that something was worth it or that they spent their time in a way that they appreciate. So understanding these kind of emotions throughout the process is going to help you find, you know, what is the most difficult for people and how do I create content that um, makes sense to them or helps them the most at those low points or improves um, the points that go up. Now the third is information architecture, which I touched on before as well. This is a visual representation of a product's infrastructure, features, and hierarchy. Um, this helps you basically plan and organize the contents of a website or app before you actually start to design for it or actually start to build for it. Um, so a lot of the time, this can be done through diagramming, which I would highly recommend that you do through FigJam. You can have all of these different um, rectangles or all of these different items be the screens that you would actually hit whenever you're in a particular site. And all of these flow um, kind of arrows and all these like bits of the diagram 
are leading you through um, how you get there. So you can think of all of them maybe as like one click or one hover. So in this case, if you had a landing page that has different pieces of information, it can go into like three main sections and you can see this section uh, dives into this one on the far left. And maybe this is some kind of sign up flow or maybe this is some kind of like use flow that goes from the left to the right um, with all these pieces of information that are only accessible once you've hit this particular point. And so understanding your information architecture is going to help you again, figure out the flow and figure out what users are looking for and how long it takes for them to get there as they're going through um, your product. Any questions about those methods that we just talked about or like what content driven design actually is? Cool. Um, something I didn't actually talk about is like what to put instead of lorem ipsum. So kind of going back to this example, I mentioned that like maybe if you're in this case, you want to talk to actual users and have them actually write the bios that they would put. That's an example of better um, content driven design or better actual content to put in your work. Um, so instead of using lorem ipsum, you know, try your hand at writing your own actual example of what it's going to be. So if you're making, let's say, you're making the delivery app for a restaurant for the midterm, um, instead of just writing like description of the dish, write an actual description of the dish, reference the restaurant's menu, see how long their descriptions tend to be. Are there weird cases where there's items with no description? Are there cases where the item is actually like six different items under one thing and you have to have a really, really long description? Um, for the images, instead of having a placeholder image for everything, you can use um, a plugin that we'll talk about later or upload images of all of the actual content or all of the actual menu items that they have. So you can better visualize, you know, what kind of colors are going to end up on the screen. Maybe it's a lot of brown and green if it's food. Um, and then how are they going to interact with each other? Um, instead of any of the kind of graphics I talked about earlier, these kind of charts or data visualizations, you can always actually make those visualizations using dummy data or dummy that, uh, data that you've gotten from the restaurant that's reflective of what they'd actually be looking at. Cool. So the next thing that we want to talk about is plain language, which is a really important facet of accessible design that is a little bit different from a lot of the stuff that we've talked about. So accessible design, often you think of things like the web content accessibility guidelines, things like color, having your text be dark enough. Um, but plain language is a little bit more abstract and it talks about the way that we understand written communication um, in any kind of product. So plain language is communication that your audience can understand the first time they read or hear it. So it's information that doesn't have to be explained a second time the way that I'm literally explaining it right now. Um, but if you look at this um, sentence, it's kind of a self-referential example. This makes sense probably the first time that you read it or when I said it out loud. This initiative basically grew out of a government group that was promoting the use of plain language, particularly in government communications. Have you ever been to like, the DMV's website, or just read any kind of tax documentation. It is so dense and it is so hard to actually understand. Um, the goal of this initiative was to make these things more universally understandable. If you think of something like taxes, you know, it's a kind of this general sentiment to everybody ever that taxes are really hard to do. And if you think about like, if you are maybe a college student who has like a college level education, if it is confusing for you, it's going to definitely be confusing to people who maybe have English as a second language or who are don't, have, don't understand English at all, um, or just haven't never had to come into contact with like government paperwork ever before. And this, because of this, um, that kind of documentation and that kind of writing is really inaccessible. It's really difficult for people to get the information that they need and do the tasks that they have to do. So design accessibility, like I mentioned, goes beyond just the visual elements, but also to this kind of conceptual level um, of making sure that language uh, makes sense to people as easy as or as quickly as possible. So there's a basic checklist that you can see um, on the plainlanguage.gov website, which we'll uh, recommend that you take a look at this week. Um, in plain language, content needs to have useful headings. So beyond just the actual text that you put, the way that you organize it should also make sense. So in this like diagram itself, it has this clear don't say and say um, kind of delineation that makes it easily skimmable or easily readable. So these headings give you a lot of information that you can visually digest without having to read bulky text. Um, it's organized to serve the user's needs. It uses language like you instead of this kind of academic third person that we've been really conditioned to use all the time. You ever had to write like a scholarly article or had to write a paper. Um, they really encourage that you say like, the researchers did this or like we did this. Um, and you never actually talk to the reader. In the case of UI UX design, you 
probably want to actually say you. And if you can tell when I teach, I'm also using the word you very often as if I'm just talking to you because it wouldn't necessarily make sense for me to be like, and designers should always do X, Y, Z. I am talking to you. I am teaching you and in the same way, whatever app you're creating, whatever product you're creating, you're talking directly to the user. They're the one that's actually interacting with it. Using short sections and short sentences as well is a way to be a little bit more accessible. Cut out any words that are not um, helpful or that do not actually contribute to the meaning and then um, make sure to omit excess words. Like, you know, whenever you have to hit like a word minimum or a word maximum on an essay to cut out all the adverbs, cut out all of the kind of extra descriptors, that's really helpful in being more accessible as well. And the final two things here, um, using concrete familiar words, um, shying away from two abstractive concepts and going into words that are a little bit more real or tangible is really helpful. And finally, using lists and tables to simplify complex material. You can imagine a version of this that is not broken into this don't say and say t-chart. If it instead just listed all of these objects one by one, it would be quite difficult to actually digest, but the way that they visually organized it is a little bit easier as well. So plain language on the web is a lot more common, I guess, than necessarily seeing plain language in printed documentation. Um, but on the web and on a digital kind of environment, people are a lot more prone to skimming. Your attention span when you're actually on your computer is quite low. We're all very aware of this. Um, and so as a result, if you're creating an app and you write more than like three words or pieces of text, people are going to start skimming that stuff. Um, so these are kind of basic rules that you might want to take a look at, like saying um, never using click here as a link, link instead of using um, basically information that describes what you're going to get when you click it um, using a lot of white space so that pages are easy to scan these two examples are here this is quite dense i probably would look at this and see the 15th and then the 25th and not really process any more information but if you uh, put it into this diagram it's a lot easier to quickly understand um, using the same words that your readers would use are helpful so if you're kind of like optimizing for like a search engine um, if somebody is off, uh, going to google like Figma class or Figma lesson or Figma, you know, information. Uh, I would want to put those words on my website for Figma decal to make sure that it shows up so that people find the information that they're looking for. If you've ever gone to a website or a book online or a scholarly article and controlled F anything, you're going to want to make sure that those words that people are likely to look for show up are in places that make sense. And then finally, something that we've touched on a couple of times is don't assume too much context. Your readers um, need to have assume like minimal knowledge of the subject or minimal context going into your um, product. So make sure that you are explaining things as you go rather than assuming that they would already know everything um, from the get-go. Any questions about plain language? A lot of the um, information that you would need when you want to use plain language, which I would highly encourage you to look at, is on plainlanguage.gov. Um, so hopefully that will be a good resource to you as well. All right, the last thing we're going to talk about today is Figma plugins. So we've mentioned this briefly during the FigJam lecture, um, but we're going to give you basically a long list of different plugins that we highly encourage that you check out. For the most part, if you have anything that you wish you had in Figma, it probably exists. Somebody on Twitter already built it and it's already on community for you to use. Um, so with plugins, you can basically do things like bringing in real data, customizing experiences and making more efficient workflows. And I think one of the main things that brings somebody from like a beginner Figma user to kind of an intermediate or advanced user is leveraging those plugins to get all these kind of superpowers in your files. So what is a plugin? We've talked about this briefly. Um, they quote unquote serve as little power ups and help extend Figma's functionality. Um, they essentially help you do things like automations, filling in dummy data like we talked about earlier, filling in actual content that you can use, checking accessibility and more. Um, and these are constantly growing. People are continuously making more and more plugins um, that are becoming a lot um, easier to integrate into your workflows as well. And if you are interested in coding something, you can you know, make one yourself as well. Again, they function a lot like, let's say, Chrome extensions, if you want to think of like a, a, a case that you might have used something like this. So we split these up into a couple of different things. I'm not going to open any of these, um, but you're more than welcome to explore these. You can Google them on, um, you can just Google them, like this, the name, and then Figma plugin, or you can go to the community and search them up there. Um, but I'll highlight kind of my favorite ones. Better Font Picker is really helpful. Um, if you've ever used like the Figma font library here, um, it is hard because it has all of these texts um, and it has all of these fonts and then doesn't show you um, previews of any of them. 
somebody was really sick of this, so they made better font picker, which actually gives you a um, kind of preview of what each font looks like. Um, find and replace is going to let you do things like basically control F functionality for text across your document, which is something that is really highly requested, but doesn't exist yet. Um, and then the similar thing is also quite helpful um, for selecting all items with some kind of property. This exists kind of naively in Figma already. If you do the quick access panel that we've mentioned before, uh, which is um, command slash or the question mark one. Um, and so if you search for something here, like select all, and it selects, for example, all text layers really easily from here. Um, Similar plugin, however, is going to give you a lot more power and control um, in doing what you need to do there. Accessibility plugins, I would really recommend that you um, download at least one of these and kind of continuously check your work. Um, basic things like color contrast are things that we expect out of you and it's not very difficult to check these plugin functions make it a lot easier to do so so we are expecting that your work is at least to some level accessible um, but i would highly recommend able um, it lets you check color contrast ratios quite quick, quickly and also simulate what color vision deficiencies might look like so different kinds of color blindness it lets you um, see what that's going to look like so you have a better idea of it um, viewports is also quite interesting and it lets you preview designs in a variety of device sizes really quickly to ensure responsiveness. This is what we've talked about today with auto layout, making sure that things are responsive. So if you're doing something on iPhone 13 or like a Samsung Galaxy, um, that the product that you've made is useful and efficient on both of those rather than only being you know, useful on like an iPhone 13, for example. So downloading viewports is going to be really helpful to quickly just visualize that. Content plugins, these are actually quite useful for this week's homework. Um, and also for, let's say you wanna make like a resume. Um, Annie Wang who made these slides actually also like did this where she used a Google Sheets thing that would upload all the data from her resumes. So she, would able to, she was able to write it in Google Sheets and get things like spell check and also really quickly modify it just by changing the sheet or the table of itself instead of having to go into the designs. Um, so Google Sheets thing is gonna let you basically insert data from a spreadsheet into your work. So if you look into this example, it's a little bit small. Um, she's listed all of these different names of dishes, prices of dishes, dividers, and then descriptions. Um, and it's allowed her to quickly import that into her work without having to go into each of these text boxes and type in what she, what each item was. So Google Sheets seems really sped up her workflow there. I also recommend taking a look at charts. If you need to use um, any kind of customizable charts in Figma, there's not a lot of really native ways to do so. And this is going to let you put in real or random data to generate these, generate these charts that you can use as um, better kind of content for your work. Um, some more stuff, just like kind of random things that are kind of fun. Um, the timer, this existed before the FigGem timer existed. If you're in FigGem, I would use the native timer, but if you're in Figma, you can go ahead and download this and you can have a timer that everybody on the file can see. Um, I think it just treats it as a piece of text that it edits every second um, so that it can be visible to everybody. Um, and then blobs. You need blobs, they're kind of hard to draw. So they've made a plugin to do that for you. And then finally, we do a shout out to this every year because one of our friends made it. Uh, there's a Figma Tetris plugin that lets you literally play Tetris in Figma. If you like Tetris, you should check it out. It's made quite well. Um, and basically, I think this is a really good example of like a very super powered plugin that lets you do all these kinds of interactions. Somebody else, for example, basically made the entire Legend of Zelda in Figma as well as a plugin. So you can move the character around with WASD, um, basically like play this entire game within a design file really easily. Cool. Uh, again, going to community and actually figuring out how to find and install these. So in the file browser in Figma, you can click on the community page. So if you're in the home page right here, uh, if you go to the top left, you see explore community, or if you're on web, you can go to figma.com slash community. Um, and then if you go here, there's a pill that says plugins. So I can click on that and it's going to show me tons of popular plugins. So here has ones for documentation. Um, and then also just some popular ones that people are using right now. If you look here as well, some of them have this icon that is purple and blue. If it is both purple and blue, it means that it works on Figma and FigJam. Whereas if it's just blue, it only works on Figma design. If it's just purple, it only works on FigJam. So I just make sure that you are cognizant of that if you're trying to use something on FigJam. Um, if you actually want to install one of these, what you would do here um, is click on one of these different things like better font picker and just press install. So normally when you see a file like for homework, it's gonna say duplicate. 
If you install it, it'll go ahead and add it immediately to your workspace, which you can then access by going here, right clicking and going to plugins. And then you can go ahead and um, activate it here. All the plugins will generally have their own like in-house directions. Like, oh, you have to select something first. You select two objects first. It'll pop up like its own modal or basically um, menu to help you navigate as well. Cool. Um, again, to run a plugin, you can right click on the canvas, select the plugin that you want. Um, you always have to run a plugin manually. It's not going to just go ahead and start running as soon as you open Figma. So it'll always like be something that you have to start doing. And you can't run plugins um, like two at the same time, I believe. Um, and they can't run in the background. You have to have like the page focused. Most of them do not take very long to actually work. I um, would just keep it in mind if you're like, oh, I'm gonna go set up some dummy data and do something else, it's probably gonna stop. Um, so just keep in mind that you have to be present to be running these. Cool. Again, these are available in FigJam. I would check them out. We also have widgets in FigJam now, which we played around with a little bit later, uh, earlier, and we, may, we might reference later on as well. But for the most part, that's about it for plugins. Are there any questions? about plugins, how to use them, or what is popular. Oh, oh boy. All of the lights turned off. Can you hit those hit the switches here? Well, we have just about one minute left. So just to wrap up for today, um, we do have homework this week. We know you're fresh off the midterm, um, but we do want to make sure that the skill is practiced really quickly because it, it takes a little bit for it to set in. Um, this is not going to be due until after spring break. So it's going to be due the Tuesday that we come back from break um, at 5 p.m. as per usual, but you'll have that time to work on it. We do not expect you to do work on this over break. It is not a longer homework than any of the other ones, but the concept is a little bit tricky. Um, so we'll be talking about this as well in lab where we go through a very, very well-made demo of auto layout. Please come to this lab. I also really want to reiterate that lab is a mandatory part of this course and is a big reason why we offer the course in the first place. Um, we really wanted to make sure that we were able to have people get really small group interaction with a TA because that's something that we're able to offer um, that we can't offer to auditors. So please do come to your labs. And if you can't, please respect your TA's time by letting them know that you can't attend. We do track attendance for labs and they are a significant portion of your grade. So make sure that you're attending them. And if you aren't attending them, make sure that you make them up during office hours or by doing the work on your own. But again, this week um, is a particularly helpful um, process. This file was made with like a ton of care. I would highly recommend that you um, go through it even if you don't finish it in class on your own. It basically just makes you do every single setting and auto layout and get a little bit comfortable with each of them. The secret word for today is going to be hug, H-U-G, as for hugging contents in auto layout. Um, so H-U-G, hug, is the secret word again um, for today. And that's going to be about it. Um, please make sure to um, take a look at the homework this week. We know we haven't had it for the past couple of weeks, so just be cognizant of that. Um, and then also with the midterm deadline, um, feel free to reach out to us if you need a little bit more time or if you haven't been able to submit it yet. We will always prefer that you do the work late and still get the practice rather than not do it at all. Um, so just let us know when we're more than happy to accommodate. All right. Thank you so much. Um, we'll get this lecture posted soon. Yeah, hug. All right. Thank you. Have a nice night. Is that the recording?